Maybe for people who knew Jeffrey Dahmer, it was hard to believe that such an amiable pleasant to be with, courteous with a sense of humor, conventionally handsome, and charming in manner, bright young man, could be a harm to anyone. But the truth was more horrible than what anyone could even imagine. Jeffrey Dahmer was born May 21, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was the first of two sons of his family and his father was a research chemist. It is said that his mother suffered from depression and was so argumentative with her husband and their neighbors. Neither parent devoted much time to their son. Jeffrey had been an energetic and happy child, but became notably quiet and timid after some time. In October 1966, his mother gave birth to his brother David, and the attention they gave to Jeffrey became even less. From an early age, Dharma manifested an interest in dead animals and their bones. In their new house in Ohio, Dharma began collecting large insects such as dragonflies and moths and the skeletons of small animals, such as chipmunks and squirrels, and his father who believed this is his son's scientific curiosity, teached him how to safely bleach and preserve animal bones. From his freshman year at high school Jeffrey was seen as an outcast. By the age of 14, he had begun drinking beer and hard alcohol in daylight hours, hiding his liquor inside the lining of the jacket he wore to school. Although largely uncommunicative, he was so polite and highly intelligent but with average grades. Despite being regarded as a loner, he became something of a class clown, who often staged pranks. When he reached puberty, Dharma discovered he was gay. But he did not tell his parents, and he began fantasizing about dominating and controlling a completely submissive male partner. In one occasion, Dharma concealed himself in bushes with a baseball bat and waited for a jogger he found attractive to pass by. But the jogger didn't pass by on that particular day. Dharma later said this was his first attempt to attack someone. In September 1977, Jeffrey's parents decided to divorce and his father, mother and brother moved out of the house, and Jeffrey was home alone. And that's what led to Dharma's first murder. Three weeks after his graduation in 1978, Jeffrey picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks. They drank together in Dharma's house, but when Hicks wanted to leave, Dharma hit him with a 10-pound dumbbell from behind and strangled him, then dissected the body and dissolved the remains in acid. Six weeks later, Dharma's father and his fiance returned home, where they discovered Jeffrey living alone. That August he enrolled at Ohio State University, hoping to major in business. But he was dropped out after just three months because of his drinking problem and horrible grades. In January 1979, Dharma enlisted in army in Texas, and trained as a medical specialist, but because of his alcohol abuse, he was dropped out of the army as well. He went back home, and his father tried to wean his son off alcohol, but was not successful. Dharma's grandmother, was the only family member to whom he displayed any affection, so his father sent him to live with her in Wisconsin. This new influence in his life, initially brought results, and in early 1982, he found employment at a blood plasma center for 10 months before being laid off. Then in 1985, he started working in a chocolate factory. Shortly after Dharma found this job, he got familiar with gay bars and bathhouses. But as he was tired of his partners moving and wanted them numb, he added sleeping pills in their drinks, giving them liquor laced with the sedatives. After some time, the owner of the bar found out, and banned him from entering the bar. Dharma started to do this actions, in hotel rooms. On November 20, 1987, he met his second ever victim, his name was Stephen Toomey. According to Dharma, he had no intention of murdering Toomey, but rather intended to simply drug him and lie beside him as he explored his body. The following morning however, he woke up to find Toomey dead. He disposed Toomey's body, in a big suitcase and trash. Following the murder of Toomey, he began to actively seek victims near gay bars. 
he would drug his victim and after engaging in sexual activity, he would strangle them. He sometimes boiled and cleansed the skulls in bleach, and kept them and took Polaroid photographs of the bodies in suggestive positions. In September 1988, Dharma's grandmother, asked him to move out. Largely because of his drinking, his habit of bringing young men to the house late at night, and the foul smells from the basement and the garage. Dharma had killed five of his victims till then, he moved into the Oxford Apartments in Milwaukee. Within one week of his moving into the new apartment, he started killing again. He believed that by keeping some of his victims' body parts, he could remember their appearance, so he kept some parts like the victims' skulls, hands and genitals. And at this point, he started to keep the victims' heart, biceps, and portions of flesh from the legs in plastic bags, and placed them in the fridge for later consumption. He then rinsed the rest of the flesh off the skeleton using soil X to be able to paint and keep the skulls and dispose of the rest of the bones in trash. In some occasions, he even drilled holes in his victim's skull, and poured acid or hot water into it, in the hopes of making human zombies who do whatever he wanted. But obviously he was not successful, and the victims went into a coma, before death. But one of his infamous murders happened when he invited a 17-year-old boy named Konarak Synthesymphone, to his house. After taking some photographs, Dharma drugged the boy into unconsciousness, injected acid into his skull, and went out to buy some beers. When he came back he saw the boy, sitting outside the apartment, he was dizzy and couldn't speak but three ladies were talking to him and the women had phoned 911. When the officers arrived, Dharma told them that Synthesymphone was his boyfriend, and they let Dharma to bring the poor boy back to his apartment and told the three women not to interfere. They even went inside the apartment, and even though there was the corpse of Dharma's previous victim lying on the bedroom floor, the officers didn't search enough to see it, and finally they left the boy with Dharma. Upon the departure of the officers from his apartment, Dharma again injected acid into Synthesymphone's brain, and the next morning, he dismembered both of his victims. On July 22, 1991, finally the day had come to put an end, upon Dharma's criminal acts, he brought a 32-year-old man named Tracy Edwards to his apartment, to pose for nude photographs. In the apartment, Dharma handcuffed Edwards, and while watching the Exorcist movie and playing with a knife, told him that he was going to eat his heart. Edwards tried to calm him down, and convince him that he was his friend to stop him from attacking. Edwards asked twice to use the bathroom. In the second time he noted Jeffrey was not holding the handcuffs, so he punched him in the face, knocking Dharma off balance, and ran out the front door. He straightly went to police officers, and took them to Dharma's apartment. There, they found a large knife and 74 Polaroid pictures of Dharma's previous victims in the bedroom. Dharma tried to fight and escape but was not successful. After that, they even found the head and body members of the victims in refrigerator and gallons full of acid and body remains. Beginning in the early hours of July, 23 1991, Dharma's investigations started by Detective Patrick Kennedy, and Detective Dennis Murphy. Dharma readily admitted to having murdered 17 young men. In the investigations, he said he killed because he wanted to be with someone good looking at any cost. And he wanted to make an altar with his victims' skulls, where he believed he could draw a sense of power from, at a preliminary hearing. On January 13, 1992, Dharma pleaded guilty but insane to the murders. Dharma's trial began on January 30, 1992. The defense arguing that Dharma suffered from a mental disease and some psychiatrists diagnosed Dharma with a psychotic disorder that was driven by obsessions and impulses, and he was unable to control himself. But some other psychiatrists testified that Dharma was without mental disease or defect at the time he committed the murders. They described Dharma as a calculating and cunning individual, able to differentiate between right and wrong, with the ability to control his actions, 
The psychiatrists believed that, Dharma killed those men, because he wanted to kill the source of his homosexual attraction to them. In killing them, he killed what he hated in himself. One of the psychiatrists even spoke kindly about him and stated, Dharma is amiable, pleasant to be with, courteous, with a sense of humor, conventionally handsome, and charming in manner, he was, and still is, a bright young man. The trial lasted two weeks. The defense's argument that he was insane was rejected, and he was ruled to be sane and not suffering from a mental disorder at the time of each of the murders for which he was tried. Dharma read from a statement prepared by himself in the court. In this statement, he emphasized that he had never wanted freedom following his arrest, and he frankly wished for his own death. He further stressed that none of his murders had been motivated by hatred, and as the doctors said, was because of a mental disorder, and that this medical knowledge had given him some peace, and that, although he understood that society would never forgive him, he hoped God would. He asked for no consideration. He was then sentenced to 17 life imprisonments and he was transferred to the Columbia Correctional Institution. For one year, he was in solidarity confinement for his own safety. In the next two years, he lived in a less secure unit and asked for Bible, and he was baptized after a while. And once, he asked the minister of the church if he was doing a sin being alive. According to Dharma's family, he had long been ready to die, and accepted any punishment which he might endure in prison. On July 3, 1994, a fellow inmate, unsuccessfully attempted to slash Jeffrey's throat with a razor embedded in a toothbrush. Dharma received superficial wounds and was not seriously hurt in this incident, but on the morning of November 28, 1994, Dharma and two other inmates were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym, for approximately 20 minutes. One of them named Christopher Scarva, attacked Dharma and the other inmate with a 20-inch metal bar, and they were found with severe head injuries. Both of them were pronounced dead in the hospital. Scarver who was a schizophrenic criminal, believed that God told him to kill them. He was sentenced to two additional terms of life imprisonment for the murders of Dharma, and Anderson. Dharma had stated in his will that, he wished for no services to be conducted, and that he wished to be cremated. In September 1995, Dharma's body was cremated, and his ashes divided between his parents. Lionel Dharma, Jeffrey's father, published a book named, A Father's Story, and donated a portion of the proceeds from his book to the victims' families. Joyce Flint, Jeffrey's mother, died of cancer in November 2000. Prior to her death, she had attempted suicide on at least one occasion. Dharma's younger brother, David, changed his surname and lives in anonymity. And that's how the story of life and crimes of the most infamous cannibal of the United States, was put to an end. Thanks for watching this video. Tell us about your ideas in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.